Right, I've got it recording now. So um, we'll make a start and uh, I'd like to welcome you to this Labour Housing Group Northeast meeting. Um, it's, this is, I think, the first Zoom we've done for Labour Housing Group Northeast, but those of you who are LHG members will know we've done quite a lot for LHG nationally. But we're really, really pleased to have Sarah and Roberta with us to talk about the white paper. We're not pleased to be talking about the white paper, I'm afraid, because as you're here and as I'm sure many of you know, uh, it has drastic um, implications for the whole country and, um, as, as we'll hear, uh, fairly drastic implications for areas such as the North East. So we're going to start with Sarah, who's the director of IPPR North um, and comes from a, a planning an urban policy background. Um, we've talked planning matters over a number of years um, and I'm very pleased that she's here to, to talk to us. Uh, and then we'll hear from Roberta about the Labour Planning Commission and what difference there is between that and the Tories white paper. Um, and then we'll have time for questions. Um, what I'd really like you to do is to put your questions in the chat. And if you if you can just restrict um, your chat comments to, to questions, that would be really good because then we can we can see them quite easily. Um, or if you if you want to ask a question but haven't quite framed it yet, just just say that. Okay, so I'll hand over to Sarah. If you'd like to say a little bit more about yourself, please do, to start. Yeah, with. okay, no problem. Um, thanks, Sheila, and, and thanks for the invitation to come along tonight. Um, it, it, I think it's a, it's a really important topic, and I'm really delighted to have the chance to, to talk it through um, with, with you all. Uh, so, so as Sheila said, um, I'm the director of IPPR North. So IPPR North is, we always describe ourselves as a sort of dedicated think tank for the North of England. We were set up 16 years ago in the Northeast um, with the intention of trying to give voice to some of the concerns uh, at a regional level about the challenges and issues that people face um, in the Northeast, Northwest, Yorkshire and Humber that aren't always heard or articulated clearly uh, at Westminster. And we wanted to try and give voice to some of that and to challenge the very sort of centralised way in which our, our policymaking um, process works um, in the UK. Um, so we, we, we do lots of um, pieces of research. Um, we've done a lot on devolution. We've done a lot on transport investment, done a lot on, um, on education and skills. Uh, and more recently, we've been doing bits and pieces on, on housing and, and planning as well. Um, so just last week, we published a paper looking at um, supported housing, particularly for people who are most vulnerable. Um, so people fleeing domestic abuse uh, or people who are asylum seekers uh, or who are at risk of unemployment. Uh, sorry, a risk of homelessness. Um, we um, did a bit of work, which we published last week, which highlighted the fragmentation of that supported housing, um, particularly for the most vulnerable. Um, and we've also got another piece of work coming up uh, in November, which is going to be looking at um, the decarbonisation of housing in the north and that agenda and, and what that might mean in a kind of post-COVID um, uh, landscape. You know, could decarbonisation act as a sort of economic stimulus um, for the North, um, given the, the scale of the challenge that, that we face. So that, yeah, that's a little bit about us. We, we do a lot of research, we do a lot of events and kind of gathering people together to talk about issues like this. Um, and we, we try to um, you know, provide a bit of fresh thinking and, and, and some new ideas to help kind of move policy conversations um, along. We are part of the national IPPR as well. So we work quite closely with them on, on some of our projects. So yeah, so that's a little bit about, um, a little bit about us. Um, I, as Sheila said, I'm, uh, I'm really interested in planning. I'm, I'm not a planner. Um, my background is economic development, um, but I've always been really interested in the kind of relationship between land use planning and economic development and how planning has increasingly been driven by uh, an economic growth imperative um, and how that has, I guess, changed and, and affected the, the way in which planning operates and the way in which it sees itself. So I guess that, um, what I want to say tonight very much draws on, on some of the work I've done previously looking at some of these issues uh, and on my perspective uh, as you know from that kind of regional northern perspective, uh, if you like. Um, so I hope I hope that's I hope that's useful. So um, I'm based in Bolton, by the way, um, just to kind of give you give you an idea of, of um, what my geographical um, uh, sort of um, location is. 
So, um, so I just want to, in terms of the planning white paper, I mean, obviously, um, you'll probably all have had a chance to look at it. I mean, it's a bit, you know, there's a lot of stuff in there and there's a lot of um, rhetoric um, and there's obviously been a lot of pieces written about it um, in, in recent in recent months. So I just wanted to, I, I'm not going to try and cover all of it, um, but I've just picked out four or five kind of key things that I thought would be worth exploring um, tonight with you. And, and, and there may be other things that, um, that we can talk about after, but just want, these are the sort of things that kind of really stood out for me, really. Um, the first thing is about, um, you know, understanding the purpose of planning and what planning is for. Um, and I think the, the rhetoric in the white paper uh, reflects a kind of decade long tradition of plan, planning bashing um, by the Conservative government and, and by the coalition government before that. And it very much reduces it to a bureaucratic burden, which, which is, is seen as sort of standing in the way of, of economic progress. Um, and the blame for all of our housing challenges um, whether it's about quality or, or um, destroying the green bill or um, the lack of affordability um, per quality, they're all laid at the door of planning. Um, and I think that's, uh, I think that kind of framing of planning as a bad guy in all of this is, is really unfortunate. Um, and I think it underplays the actual power of planning um, uh, to do good things as, as, as well as, you know, obviously planning like any profession uh, has, its, has its challenges. But I think over the whole, in the whole planning as, as a force for good in this country should be something that, that we celebrate and, and that we acknowledge. Um, and I thought it was worth, you know, given where we are in, in the terms of COVID-19, it, it's kind of worth reflecting on the fact that, uh, and I think from a, a labour point of view too, you know, trying to get us back to what, what is planning for and, and, and reminding ourselves of the really progressive origins of it, that, you know, the deep concern about public health in the turn of the 19th century and specifically the spread of disease in industrial, in, in industrial cities, um, particularly those that grew very rapidly, like, like places like Middlesbrough, um, that the concern about public health was actually what helped to bring planning into, into being in the first place. Um, and the concern about poor sanitation and, and poor, um, poor housing, overcrowding, and how that actually contributed to um, things like cholera and other, other disease, that, um, that really has um, that fueled the development and built the case for having a decent planning system to try and safeguard standards and to regulate how land and, and buildings were used. And I think at a time of COVID, it's worth just reminding ourselves of that. And we know that from the, the evidence that we've seen so far about how COVID is, is operating, that those areas with, with high levels of deprivation are also being disproportionately affected by COVID. Um, and I think there's a, a clear link there in terms of housing and the way that we plan our areas, helping to determine, predetermine, if you like, um, uh, some of our, our health outcomes as well. And I think that that's something that this crisis is, is really bringing home. So I think... Um, uh, you know, whilst the white paper talks quite grandly about planning being a powerful tool for creating visions of how places can be and engaging communities in that process, and that's a, a direct quote, uh, it talks about the importance of green spaces, and it talks about a sense of community, um, and it, that it also argues that, it, you know, planning should generate net gains for the quality of our built and natural environment, um, uh, not just no net harm. Um, so it's got this kind of very grandiose kind of language on there and a lot of emphasis on beauty. Um, uh, and, you know, there's a lot of, this is a very kind of, you'll have seen this as well on some of the, the kind of wider social media discussion um, about, about the white paper. A lot of conservative MPs are very interested in this idea of beauty and, and feeling that planning should be sort of a force for, for improving beauty. But that isn't necessarily the same thing as quality. Um, and I think that's the bit that's kind of missing from, uh, the, from the, the white paper. There's an assumption that, that beauty and quality are one and the same thing, and, and I think they're, they're quite different, actually. Um, uh, it does talk about proposals for a national design guide, a national model design code, and a revised manual for streets, and, and we're supposed to be getting those um, uh, this, this autumn. Um, but I think the sentiment behind that, the sort of, the sort of vision that they've put forward of, of what planning is for, um, it isn't really undermined by it isn't really underpinned by any challenge to the to the ch the really difficult questions that, that we have to grapple with in the north and, and the northeast of economic viability, um, and it doesn't really get to grips with that, um, and it doesn't really acknowledge the fact that a lot of the, the the outcomes that we want to see the good outcomes that we want to see in our communities, whether that's affordable housing or or good design standards or high quality housing. Um, that they are actually most of nine times out of ten determined by the, the conversation about about viability. Um, so I think that that's the first thing for me about that sense of purpose of planning 
um, and that the sort of uh, the kind of strange way in which the white paper tries to deal with that, in, both in terms of um, giving planning a very hard time, but at the same time arguing that we need to have this sort of emphasis on, on beauty. Um, but the kind of the weaknesses of that argument further in. The second thing I wanted to mention was about the role of democracy. So the, the white paper has a, a huge amount, there's a lot, a big theme running through it about the importance of engaging people in the planning process. And, and it sets out a number of proposals for how it argues that we should improve participation within the decision-making process of planning. Uh, and I mean, I guess this isn't new. Successive governments have attempted to try and involve people to a greater or lesser extent in, in planning. Um, so, for example, the, uh, um, the um, National Planning Policy Framework back in 2012 put forward the idea of, of neighbourhood plans, and, and this government has suggested that we retain those, uh, although it doesn't say anything about funding for those or, or how people should be supported to actually do that. Um, but they, they, the proposals in this white paper rely very much on the idea of digital participation, um, and uh, it calls for like a move that the local plan process should be should be transformed into a data exercise uh, and that if you make all and it basically says you know where all local plans become interactive and web-based and that it, it assumes will help to drive better engagement um, so there's an interesting thing there about you know whether that really would drive better engagement we know that digital participation is not is not universal particularly with COVID has revealed the challenges of that um, but it also assumes that data is neutral um, and the you know, data is a, an objective source of information about, about um, planning and place. Um, and I think there's a danger in that and that data is not neutral and how you analyze it and how you produce it, as I well know working in the think tank is, is often very, very loaded. Um, so I think that's, that's a concern. Um, and I think the other concern with it is that it, it t the way in which the, the tone of uh, around participation in data, and then further on in the white paper, when it talks about data as a, a better way to, to actually do planning, it seems to, to suggest that there's a, a move towards a greater automation within planning, that decisions about planning decisions should be, planning decisions should be quite automated and should be quite um, universal in the way that they're, they're, they're carried out which suggests that you lose some of that qualitative understanding of place uh, and some of the, the nuance in the debate about whether something should be, should be approved or not. Um, so I think that's a, a, a kind of a red, a bit of a, a warning sign for me in terms of um, the direction of travel. I think there's also a tension because the paper uh, and, and indeed all of the government's um, announcements in recent times have had this big emphasis on speed and on streamlining. And again, the, the white paper talks a lot about the need for streamlining. So there's a bit of an inconsistency there. You want people to be more engaged in the conversation. You want people to be more involved in, in the local planning process. But at the same time, you want to speed the whole thing up. Um, and I think inevitably, when you want to involve people in the democratic process, that, type, that takes time and it demands time and investment um, to get people on board. And so there's a, there's a, a sort of a, a clear kind of inconsistency there for me. Um, and I think also there's an interesting question about democracy. Um, and for any of you of you who of you have ever been involved in kind of planning decisions, you'll you'll know that the weight of public opinion um, is not necessarily enough to to sway the decision making process and, and planning. And the end of the day, it comes down to kind of material considerations. Uh, and that if you find yourself if you, you if you go against that, then you can find yourself in, in the appeals court. So I think the dynamic of trying to reconcile people's views about the decision making process and, and planning can be can be difficult. And I think that's oversimplified within um, the white paper. I think really this is about value really. And I think this is what a lot, there's a lot of what the white paper overlooks. And I think it's a lot of what we overlook in terms of the, the planning debate more generally. In the, you know, how people value land in their communities varies by, by person and by, by, by interest. So developers will value land based on their projections about how many houses they can sell. You know, um, others may value land because of its recreational or, or leisure purposes. Um, others still will value something because of the, the um, biodiversity or the, the natural capital that, that a piece of, of land produces. And, and the planning system is really where all of those different conceptions of value meet. Um, and, and there's also a very close link with identity too. And so I think trying to reduce that process to a simple kind of exchange and analysis of, of, uh, of purely quantitative data, um, it really overlooks the, the complexity of the decision-making process. Planning is supposed to be hard. It's supposed to be difficult because you're dealing with how people feel about their communities, how they feel about their land um, and about people's need to have a decent place to live. Um, so it shouldn't be something we just simply reduce to a, you know, computer says no exercise. So that's the second point. The third point I wanted to talk a little bit about um, was um, about the kind of... Um, 
the tensions within the paper about um, centralism versus localism. Um, and I think this comes down a bit to the to the um, the housing uh, housing market projections as well, uh, and the way that the um, the paper looks at that. So I mean, there has been in in the previous national planning policy framework, there was a big focus at that time on localism, um, and uh, that you know we needed to put the decision making process in the hands of of local people. I think was kind of the, the terminology loosely that, that that was used at that time. And we've also seen devolution um, in, in, in parts of, of England, a very, peace, very piecemeal, very kind of um, patchwork uh, in comparison to what you know, devolution in, in the devolved nations and regions. Um, but we have seen some forms of devolution and we've seen those mayoral combined authorities um, having some power over planning. So, for example, the mayoral development sites and then the work that's been going on in places like Greater Manchester, um, on, a, on a sort of uh, city regional spatial plan, which you know has come all, along with its own with its own issues, but we have started to see a little bit of what you might call localism, I guess, in, in that conversation. Um, but there's a really strong centralising tendency in this white paper, um, and I think that speaks to the government's anxiety to kind of come up with some sort of winning national formula, which will help them to build the houses required to meet demand. So they stick with a sort of three hundred thousand target, for example. Um, and they stick with a kind of fairly, I would describe fairly simplistic idea um, that, you know, in areas of high demand, you need to, um, the forecast for, for housing numbers will be large in areas of low demand, then the, the number of houses you need are, are small. So it's kind of, it tends, I think that doesn't really do us in the north and, and, and areas like northeast any favours because it assumes a sort of position of almost like managed decline, if you like. Uh, and it fails to recognise that often, in um, parts of the north, we use housing um, to, to to build a sense of place, to um, to build um, to build demand, uh, and also to to improve places for for people. Um, the housing is part of a kind of wider kind of regeneration strategy. Um, and similarly, it fails to recognise that that in many parts of the north, um, planning is actually part um, of uh, the economy. That it's part of how you build. Um, a, a stronger place uh, and I think that's a, a real concern um, particularly if it's something that, that's managed from the centre that if the, if the centre are dictating this is how many houses we think that you and Newcastle need over the next 10-20 um, years um, where is the kind of local knowledge where is the local input there to say well actually you might not be aware of this central government but you know we've got plans for x y and z and, and we know that there's further things coming down the line and I think it also fails to sort of join it up with a wider kind of discussion about infrastructure and how um, investment in um, infrastructure, whether that's transport or um, or, or town centres, um, has a close link with with um, residential use as well. And I know particularly in some town centres are thinking about you know greater use of residential um, accommodation to to help kind of improve footfall and, and help town centres come back um, from from decline. Um, but that often requires the state to go first to to take the risk, if you like. Uh, and there's very little in this paper about the sort of the role of planning and de-risking. Um, investment, particularly in, in areas um, that have that have struggled um, uh, economically. Uh, and then the other sort of concern in terms of centralising is that there's a sort of suggestion that where local authorities fail to kind of adhere to the, the new regulations they've put out about local plans, particularly the time scales they're suggesting local plans should be um, developed and, and delivered under, that the central central government can intervene at that point. Um, so I, I don't know whether um, whether that's, uh, you know, how that would actually work in practice, but, you know, there's a question there for me about whether that's the direction of travel that we want to go in, whether we want national government to be sort of coming in and just dictating what, what should happen um, in, in, a, in, a, in a local area without a lot of sort of background knowledge and, and understanding of, of um, some of the nuance. Um, and then, uh, and then fifthly, I just wanted to spend just a, the sort of brief time I've got left, I want to talk briefly about what's actually missing in, in you know, what doesn't get a lot of airtime within um, the, the planning white paper. Um, and I think overall, there's a lot of focus on housing, you know, housing is obviously a massive, you know, political um, priority for, for all governments and, you know, understandably so, because we all, you know, need a house to live in and we, we you know, uh, that's, that's okay. But I mean, this government is very focused on a kind of um, the um, houses to buy um, and that you know they kind of still believe in that kind of um, house buying kind of democracy uh, and so that means that um, 
discussions on uh, the private rental sector, uh, on um, support housing that I mentioned at the top of this conversation, particularly for the most vulnerable. Um, those issues are very much uh, seem to play sort of second fiddle in, in the discussion. Um, and uh, I think that's a concern because um, particularly the private rental sector, I think there's a, we all know that there are particular issues in, in that area. Um, and, uh, and for supported housing from the research we've done, we know that there's very little um, policy momentum around really trying to, to tackle some of the, the, the real challenges of, of helping people who are most vulnerable back into um, some sort of uh, sustainable tenancies. I think the other thing that doesn't really touch upon, and I guess I, I probably didn't expect it to, but I think it, it's probably worth acknowledging the fact that um, capacity within planning departments is, has been really badly damaged by austerity. Now, we wouldn't expect it to mention that, but I think it's, it expects a lot of a planning department which has been very badly hit over the last 10 years as a result of, of cuts. And we know that planning has been particularly affected by that. There's very little reflections on the on the work that government have already been doing. You know, like for example, there's no kind of discussion of, of the, the, there's been a lot of investigations into planning over, over the last sort of 10, 20 years. We had the Barker review, we've had um, the um, Letwin review, but there's very little kind of reference to any of those kind of sources of information, um, which, is, which is slightly odd. Um, and, and I think the other thing that there's not a lot of discussion about um, low carbon um, and not a lot of ambition around, you know, the, the potential of, of housing in this country and how we could um, use the, the challenge and opportunity of, of um, decarbonizing our homes and, and putting in place lower carbon heating systems, for example, how that could be um, really supported through the planning system. Uh, and that's a particular concern because we know from our research that the UK has the um, most inefficient homes in the whole of Europe. Uh, and in the north, we know that um, some of our homes are, 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 even, are even worse than that. Um, 40, you know, 44% um, of all homes in the north were built um, before um, 1945. Uh, and that's uh, left a real legacy in terms of um, poor housing in many areas. So I think the lack of emphasis on, on low carbon, a lack of ambition about that, I mean, it does, it does get a reference, but there's no kind of real push behind it. And I think it would have been good to see a little bit more of that, um, particularly as we kind of move into the kind of, um, uh, kind of into some sort of recovery from, from COVID at some point, hopefully. So that's some, um, I'm going to stop there. I've, I've said enough, um, but hopefully that's been a, a kind of useful um, whistle stop tour through some of my um, thoughts on, on the um, white paper and, and really happy to, to um, discuss it further. So thanks. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I didn't ask you specifically to say anything about the other paper accompanying the white paper um, about measuring, uh, assessing the uh, uh, housing need numbers. I don't know if you could want to say anything about that now or come back to that in a minute. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's some, um, well, as I was saying, I think there's a, the, I mean, I guess the key, real concern for me is that there, there has been, there's been various debates over the years about the formula that we use to try and calculate housing numbers. Um, we did have, you know, obviously, in, we did have uh, at one point the um, regional spatial strategy, which had a particular number which was calculated at a regional level. Um, and then we've kind of moved back and forth. Then that was dismantled and, 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 and sort of taken back into to national government's um, remit. Um, and now we've got this kind of new model that, that, that's come out. Um, I think my concern, as I, as I was saying, is that it's very much um, uh, based on the assumption that areas that are growing, that who, where the economy is growing will need more houses and areas that um, don't necessarily have a, um, a growing economy will, will need less. And I think, um, I mean, that's quite a simplistic interpretation, but that, that's certainly how it seems to appear to me. And that I think is problematic because it means that, um, you know, it, it, it underestimates the, the importance of planning in terms of regeneration and, and helping places to, um, uh, to, to um, recover. Um, but also that um, housing is not, you know, isn't just about um, current demand, but it's about the future demand. And, and, um, and, and I think it, it, uh, it, it, it kind of implies that, um, you know, if you're not growing, then it's just a case of managing decline. And, and yet there are other housing needs that, that may be apparent in that area that haven't really been properly taken into account by that, by that formula. Thank you very much. Yes, a lot, a lot to think about there. Um, <clears throat> we, we'll move on to Roberta, who's going to talk um, about the, the 
Labour Planning Commission. Roberta, as I'm sure many of you will know, um, was in the um, housing team, housing and, and specialised in planning for some of that time. Um, she has a social policy and housing background and was indeed a, a city councillor here in Newcastle uh, for some years. Uh, but I, I wanted her to particularly to focus on the work that she led on the, the Labour Planning Commission, which has, was published earlier this year and ha has some very interesting differences and some similarities in, in some areas. Uh, with the white right paper. So, Roberta, take us through that. Thank you, Sheila, and, and thanks for asking me um, to talk about Labour's Planning Commission. I will just direct people also to the recent article I did for Red Brick, which um, kind of summarised the differences between the planning white paper and the Labour Planning Commission. Um, and you all might find that that helpful. Um, we launched the Planning Commission report in March, which was like just the worst possible time to be launching something um, and ended up having to just do something online. So it is the intention that when we're able to have something back in Parliament, um, that we will do that. We, we launched it at conference in 2018. And um, I think it's fair to say that we started from a very different position to the government, although we were influenced in terms of needing to have a planning commission to develop a new planning policy for Labour, um, partly by what the government um, and the coalition government before it had done to the planning system over the last um, 10 years. But the planning commission was launched really within a, a very, very strong value-based framework of returning planning to its visionary roots and having two big value systems underpin it in terms of tackling inequality and addressing climate change. Um, within all of that, we recognised a whole list of things that we thought had made the current planning system dysfunctional. And it wasn't only the blame game that the government played with the planning system. You know, there were was year on year more and more planning approvals for housing that including affordable housing that wasn't built and yet planning always got the blame but there were other things um, the constant deregulation of planning the greater use of permitted development the sanctions against planning authorities for having too many appeals contracted out planning services um, too many local authorities without local plans in place and that was leading to an increasingly undemocratized, technically focused planning system that I witnessed, and I think all of us witnessed, being increasingly at the mercy of speculators and were plan making. And indeed, as I said, the vision that should be underpinning that had really taken a back seat. So that when we um, the commission itself was made up of representatives of people from, you know, RTPI and TCPA and, you know, CPRE and, and all of the big stakeholders you would expect to be on a planning commission. Um, but also we did regional events that were led by local authorities and their communities. And in we did 11 regional meetings with planners and developers and residents. And we just got, it was quite interesting really, a wall of anger is how I described it. You just had to work through the anger, particularly from the residents. But I have to say sometimes surprisingly from developers and nearly always from planning officers who really felt that you know planning was something that was just done to people. And we, and, and that's how they experience planning. And, um, you know, there was a lot of anger there and that really people 
needed to be re-engaged with the planning system. So I think we were starting in a different place to the government. I was um, pleasantly surprised when I read, you know, well, probably about the first 20 pages, because it does go on a bit in terms of its rhetoric, the, the white paper, um, about all of the, you know, and actually on analysis, it was quite... <laughs> It was quite hard to disagree with it at times. It just, you know, I ended up sort of shouting at the page going, well, if you know this, why have you ended up doing what you've done to the planning system? Um, but there were some areas that um, we had flagged, um, which I find quite interesting, actually. Um, so we mentioned um, the greater use of digitization in the planning system to improve accessibility and engagement, because we went to a really powerful workshop in Gateshead that um, uh, you know, demonstrated how you could get information across much better to people um, by giving them digital skills. And you know, they were using some quite imaginative community methods to do that. So we thought, yeah, there, there is something in this. It's not the only thing you do, but there is something in this. And we thought there should be more investment in skills and training for planners. And that is mentioned in the white paper. Um, we, for a long time, had argued for a, a nationally agreed method of assessing housing need, mostly because some um, particularly Tory authorities were quite good at um, measuring housing need in their area and, and deciding they didn't have any. So we thought, you know, that that just can't be the case. Um, and again, there was, I think, cross-party agreement that the design and quality of what is built needs to be improved, although we really do mean design and quality, whereas sometimes I think when the Conservatives talk about beauty, they're talking about preserving nice views in their rural constituencies rather than anything, you know, really to do with the quality of, of what is built. So um, in addition to making recommendations in those areas that I've just talked about, what we really wanted to do, and we thought long and hard about this, um, about how radical the change needed to be. And we thought, actually, given the degree of disengagement with the planning system, given the fact that it takes forever to make local plans, that they're quite disconnected, um, and there's no real link between national infrastructure planning um, and regions and, and local areas, that we would propose a four-tier planning system which I know sounds very bureaucratic, but what we envisaged was that actually the planning system would start with a community plan that would be ward based. Um, it would be within a, you know, a framework of a local authority plan that communities would be supported by planning professionals. But that in terms of place making, which we wanted to be at the heart of Labour's planning policy, we had to start with places that people understood and at a level that people felt comfortable with. And then that could be a building block for the local, regional and regional plan. And then regional plans would talk to the national plans and vice versa. Um, we thought that if you were going to address um, issues like climate change, you had to do something about building standards. It wasn't enough to just say, oh, yes, well, you know, we, we'll aim for zero carbon in 50 years time. But actually, we needed to change building standards to address quality, climate change and safety issues and to put in new guidance um, on how national standards would achieve high quality design. We also thought we should get rid of permitted development pretty much across the piece um, and what we really wanted in terms of developing the system of planning tiers was to allow the facilities that people need to be planned at the right spatial level. So sometimes you would want perhaps a leisure facility for a region or you might want it for a local community. 
but local communities wouldn't have the ability to plan, you know, necessarily transport or, um, I don't know, a new running track uh, in their local community, but that, you know, a regional tier could bring all of that together. And, and actually, we also thought in terms of redistribution from a from a, an infrastructure levy or topping up an infrastructure levy, that sometimes would need to go beyond a local authority level. It might be metro mayors, it might be something else. We didn't get into that debate, but we thought um, there does have to be an actual system in place here to level up, if I can steal the government's language. Um, and, and the planning system, we thought, was a major way in which um, economic development could take place. But it would be about much more than economic development. This really was about building or rebuilding communities for the future and trying to ensure that people have the services that they need on their doorstep and that they've got access to cycling or to public transport. Um, we um, also proposed introducing a land value capture system and one that would be under the control of the local community. Um, there are a number of models around the country already um, for that for the new towns. And, and we thought it was a pity that that had been done away with and it should be reintroduced. Um, and the final point that I, I want to say, because I think this is what really distinguished our approach from the, the white paper, is that we actually were really fed up with the amount um, of times that planners and developers talked about consultation, particularly with local people, because in our experience, it was a complete and utter waste of time usually round and round and round and round of consultation on a local plan that paid, generally speaking, no attention whatsoever to what people said. And we actually thought that was damaging in terms of trust. There was a net negative there. And that what we were talking about was people actively, partic sorry, actively participating in planning of their area that we would have real encouragement and incentives for people to um, get involved with their community plan and, and also in design panels and anything else that we thought could be put in place locally to give people a say over what is built and how it's maintained and sustained and rebuilt for the future. So I'll stop there and you can ask me questions. Right, thank you very much. I think that that's that really il illustrates the, the the difference in the the whole value base and and vision um, from from what um, Sarah was describing. Um, we've got uh, one question first of all from Alan. If um, Alan, if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question, if you could just say where where you're from and. Um, we have a number of people who are councillors here and a number of ordinary Labour Party members. So if you could just say if you are a representative, that would be great. Alan, are you all right to start? I think I'm not sure if he's able to. Um, is there anybody else who'd like to to answer a ask a question? In the meantime, yeah, yeah, I've 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 got a question. Yeah. Hello. All right. Um, my name's Thomas. I'm a Labour Party member, but I also work. Um, I work my day job. I work for a, a social landlord, and I'm also involved in the, the governance of a local housing organisation as well. Um, so I wouldn't say I've, I've been particularly involved massively in the, in the planning side, but I just wonder with some of the proposals that are being made, particularly around the ways that the uh, housing need calculations are, are being done, is there, mu is there much chance of the proposals in the white paper coming through the parliamentary process um, unchanged or will this cause as much consternation in the Tory shires 
as it as it will elsewhere with some of the things that's been being proposed. I know it's a bit of a political question, but I just wondered, is this going to be a bit like some of the, the previous ideas we see come from think tanks that never never quite make it into to actual legislation? Sarah, would you like to start on that point and Roberta, if you want to add in anything as well, that'd be great. Yeah, um, thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, housing needs, ass housing needs assessment is, you know, no matter what formula you use or whatever criteria you use, it, it's always massively political. Um, and, you know, I don't think there's any kind of easy way around it. And I, yeah, and I think you're right. It's massively uh, political. It's from a sort of Tory share point of view, um, it's uh, particularly problematic for, for the government. Um, and but you know they're they're trying to you know make fulfill this massive housing target. Um, they've made sort of various promises on, it and um, this is their way of trying to to address it. And um, you know I've I've no doubt that there'll be you know continuous wrangling about it in in the years years to come about it. Um, I think but I think what's really important is that, that we have a, a, for 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 developers certainly. I think it's really important that we have a, a clear formula um, and that there's some certainty about it because plan, I think that's the big role for planning to play in all of this is to provide certainty to the market uh, and to provide certainty to people who live in an area um, that, um, yeah, so I've got a small guest appearance there. Um, um, uh, you know that you need to provide certainty to people about what what housing needs are and then on how those will be delivered. So um, I, I I don't know to be honest. I think that it, it, there, there's a good chance that um, it, it probably that it probably will get through Parliament because because of the sheer need to provide housing, particularly in the aftermath of, of COVID and the kind of role that um, housing plays in, in construction and, and in terms of jobs and so on. Um, but I I think there'll be certainly a lot of um, pain and anguish and on on some of the uh, in some of those Tory showers about um, the, the sort of scale of development being being permitted, particularly in, in if, if those areas are growth areas. Um, but um, yeah, we'll we'll just have to see how that works works out. Roberta. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really good question. Um, it depends on whether they get the zonal system through without anybody really understanding what it is. And it's so vague in the white paper um, that it is possible that they will sell it to the people who are worried about the green belt as well, don't worry, because you'll be in a protected area. And um, to other areas where they do actually want some growth or some um, redevelopment that they'll be in um, one of the growth areas. So it's it's possible that um, they will convince enough um, MPs that for their constituencies, this will be a better system and that the certainty that the zonal system um, brings will help um, local communities and, and developers um, have a better understanding of what's going to happen. It's just that it's, it's so vague and it leaves so much to what will be in an accompanying local plan that, you know, in essence, it might not make the big change that everybody thinks. And we don't have enough of the detail at the moment. But um, I think there's a fair amount of unhappiness um, amongst the Tories with the current planning system because it is seen to deliver quite poor quality. And so if the government beef up what they're going to do in terms of um, trying to improve the quality of what's built, um, then they might get somewhere. I think just the other thing just to say on that is that it, it's also something to do with the incentives um, locally. Um, yeah. Because obviously a lot of um, a lot of local authorities have you know found themselves under the cosh in, in recent years because of austerity. Um, and it might be that you have some, you know, the sort of we have the new homes bonus and so on. So you might see something equivalent to kind of help buy off some of those areas um, and to kind of reassure them of the sort of benefits of growth. Um, so I guess that that might be um, part of the, the process. It's quite interesting that they they're wanting to keep 
neighborhood planning, although they haven't said much about it. And they want to keep the local elements of the community infrastructure levy going to communities. And, and I think that is part of the incentive um, system that they want to have in place. Yeah, definitely. Alan, you're back with us and uh, part of your question is about the infrastructure levy. Do you want to ask your, your questions? questions? Yeah, thanks, uh, Sheila. Sorry, I, I lost my connection for several minutes, so I didn't hear much of Roberta's um, offering there, but I'm sure it was good. <laughs> um, the, the, the problem I've got is that um, this planning uh, white paper is wrong in so many ways, in my view, um, from, you know, the attack on democracy, which I think you've spoken about, the loss of that uh, democratic input. However imperfect it is, it still exists. Um, and I think the way forward is going to be through some kind of community-based planning system. And I'm sure that, you know, Roberta's paper there touched on that, although, as I say, I didn't hear it. Um, my concern is the infrastructure levy and the impact it might have on affordable housing. Um, we've seen some projections from the LGA, for example, um, uh, quoting 66% of loss of affordable housing in places like Newcastle, with if this plan, if this planning paper was implemented, um, and things of that nature. So there's a real concern there. And you add on to that two other things which are in place, in place sorry, I've got a bit of a sore throat. Um, I haven't got COVID, mind. Um, the one that con the two that concern me um, are the, the the move by raising the limit, the ten limit of, of, of numbers of, of uh, properties developed to fifty, and that at a stroke is going to cut the amount of affordable homes are going to have. That's a real concern that I have, particularly in the rural areas. And and I come from Northumberland, as, you, as you're aware, and that's a real concern in Northumberland because they're under real pressure in terms of affordable housing there. Um, but I think the other, the other thing is that the, the thing that struck me was that some of the LJA work, if they'd apl they applied these rules um, and looked at what would the reduction in affordable housing would be if this paper was implemented over the last five years, then you had a 30,000 reduction in affordable homes. There's a real concern there, I think. And, and I, I just that's why I think it's so wrong in so many ways. Sorry, I've given a lot of facts there, but I hope you can uh, understand the point I'm making. Yeah, thank you. Sarah. Can I just ask, um, no. Alan, that, that 30,000 reduction, um, I, haven't, I haven't seen that piece in the LJ, but was that 30,000 reduction for the, for the whole of the UK? Yeah, that's right. For, yeah. Frank, for, well, for England and Wales it would be, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, I think that, I mean, I think fundamentally there's a, a real issue with how we, um, create uh, how we supply affordable homes in this country, and I think the way in which we've you know, we've we've tended to do it on the basis of of um, uh, developer contributions, um, whether that's through Section One Hundred and Six or, or the infrastructure levy, um, or actually in a lot of cases where you don't have a lot of negotiation, um, you know, a lot of sort of basis for negotiation through a kind of much more sort of uh, uh, I guess a, a much more of a, a give and take arrangement between between planners and, and developers. So I think that there's a fundamental problem with how we try to create affordable homes in this country. And I think even where you do have agreements, we've seen time and time again where the, the it's it's done in a kind of staged way, and sometimes developers can kind of push back uh, at a certain point if they haven't produced the, the amount of homes that they were able they thought they would be able to or whatever. And there's there's a constant kind of renegotiation of, of the terms. So I think. Uh, um, the, the the potential loss of affordable housing because of um uh you know as you as you point out is a real concern because we can't really afford to lose um more affordable homes because we well, we all know that there's a, a there's a massive issue with um affordability in the first place and that isn't just you know down south if you like but that's across the north as well we've got real issues with affordability and some we did some research earlier this year which showed that some of the um, biggest affordability crunches were in parts of parts of the north including parts of the northeast so uh i think that's um i think that for me the the, the real problem comes down to just how we're expecting to deliver affordable homes and i think actually 
what we're seeing in, in recent years is a sort of trend towards local authorities trying to do more themselves and um, work more closely with housing associations and other registered providers to, to supply the housing. And I think that was a trend we'll, we'll see continued. Um, but there are problems with that because of the constraints around local authority borrowing. Um, so uh, yeah, that, that, that's my kind of thoughts on that. I just You're like, muted, Sheila. Did did you cover anything about the um, infrastructure levy in in the in your work? Was that was that to me, Sheila? Yes. Yeah, um, yeah, we did. Um, and actually, we were going to come back um, to do a separate piece of work on um, the land value capture and or a levy. Um, we actually were of the opinion that the community infrastructure levy and section 106 agreement and some of the taxes that are levied on development were a very complicated system and that had, um, because of the way in which vi viability linked to them, um, it meant that actually the world for infrastructure, including housing, was often very uncertain locally and we didn't think that that was good enough and um, we find that locally there was a lot of confusion um, between the infrastructure levy and what it might deliver on section 106 agreements and then there was also a lack of or well a certain degree of anger i would say about what sometimes communities thought they were going to get through one of six agreements and the levy and what actually happened subsequently because um developers had gone back and renegotiated yeah but this so, is this is um, some houses pardon it, the system does provide some houses. I mean, yes, I was does. the chairman of the housing association and we aggressively went for section 106 and we succeeded. So, you know, don't shoot nurse because you might get something worse. Yeah, well, the problem is if you accept a, a, a system like the levy and 106 agreements and they don't work everywhere, no. um, then you know, that shouldn't, the fact that there is something in place, there is a system in place that delivers something, doesn't mean that we shouldn't be thinking of creating a system that will be much, much better. Okay. And the levy that was applied by new towns on development on each on each um, housing unit delivered was was a much simpler, better. It was a flat rate, and it was simple. And we thought something like that should go into a land um, value tax. It would be a simple system. And critically, and this is this is a really important point in delivering um, infrastructure and, and including housing, it would allow a degree of redistribution because the system that we have at the moment means that areas that have a lot of development get more than areas that might be crying out for development, but where the market doesn't deliver. So for example, we went to see a development in Hampshire that was absolutely amazing. It was amazing. Um, and they had a, a large proportion of affordable housing units. They were building, they built three new schools, two health centers, a skills unit. I mean, I could roll off, you know, because they were able to do that. They had the land and um, and there, there wasn't a lot of local opposition. But, but that's an incredible, that's a system that creates and um, makes worse, I think, inequality. And you ha we have to stand back and think, what about a system that will work everywhere and where you will get good quality development you know, whether you're in a, a, an area that finds growth more difficult or an area that's, you know, people are considering it very desirable. And that's what a labour, that's why our planning commission was different than what the Conservatives have come up with. I think it, again, it comes back to that question about viability too, that viability is the, is the, the kind of main um, 
creator of uh, extra value in the system, whether that's for affordable trans affordable housing or whether it's for infrastructure improvements like roads and um, uh, um, uh, you know schools and so on, um, then ultimately it's a it's a it's a growth based model. Um, and if your area isn't um, showing signs of, of growth or economic prosperity, then you're basically saying, well, you know, we can't afford to build any um, affordable homes. And I think that's the, that's the fundamental issue with it. So that's when you do need some sort of state intervention or, or civil society intervention to help kind of um, meet, meet the gap and, and de-risk the, uh, de the um, investment. Um, so, yeah. Right, we've got time for a very quick question if anybody else has one. Anybody else wanting to ask a question? Um, I, I, I wanted to just ask about the developer influence. We, we had, um, Labour Housing Group has been running a, a series of um, chats with influential thinkers called In Conversation With. And the very first one was um, with Bob Colnut, who just launched a book called The Pro Property Lobby, uh, which is a second book following one he'd written quite a number of years ago. And his main point is that developers and the large developers in particular hold all the keys. They 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 are driving our planning system. And my my big worry about what is proposed, and I think um, you've both emphasized this, uh, reinforces for me, is that the white paper adds to that. It doesn't doesn't change that. It it makes it worse. Um, so that we, the big developers are, are, are really driving the development in the areas where they want to do it. Is that the case? Have I got it right? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, that's one of, that's certainly one of um, the concerns that's been raised time and time again, the fact that we have a, a small number of very large developers, which pretty much dominate the market. And, and that's region, you know, and then when you look at sort of regions within that, then it's even smaller, the pool of sort of developers who can, who can build on mass. So I think there is a question there. And of course, the larger the developers are, the bigger the, um, the debt, uh, the sort of debt that they've got to service, if you like, um, which then has knock on consequences for the speed at which they're able to develop things because they only want to develop things where they can be sure they're going to get a, a really secure return on the investment. Otherwise, they can't make their debt payments. Um, so I think that's a really big concern. Um, and it kind of is a really, it's a really big barrier in, in actually delivering homes. Um, so I think there's a, I, I mean, I don't, you know, there's a question, there's been a lot of various sort of suggestions put forward about how you try to diversify the market, how to try and encourage new entrants to the to, to the um, to, to local markets, particularly the housing associations play a really important role. Um, and, and also we've seen civil society, you know, organisations more actively playing a role in buying uh, so the charities and other third sector organisations actually actually actively participating in the market too. So I think that's um, as well with, as well as local authorities. So I think that that's part of it. But yeah, it is a massive concern, and they have massive influence, you know, in terms of the the um, the way in which they can uh, you know get to politicians and, and influence the debate, um, whether and you know um, through uh, through all sorts of means. So yeah, it's it, yeah, it's a it's a big concern, and I think it it, um, it would be great if Labour were able to to say something about how we could you know deal with that and going forward. Um, we, um, I'm not, I mean, I totally agree with just what Sarah said. I, I, I wanted to raise another issue, which I think is, is relevant to this, which we did look at, and that was how you get more land into the system. Um, because one of the things that the big developers do is hold back land. So they land bank um, because they want to protect the value of the land. And one of the things that we thought a Labour government would have to do is, is get rid of that bit of dysfunctionality in the system with much greater CPO powers, um, if necessary, in order to bring more land into the system. And by bringing more land in, you, you can um, try and widen the number of people who will develop it. So, you know, some of it would we said go to put some sort of public corporation, you know, a local council or whatever and, and partners. Um, and we are saying and partners to develop. And, and in some ways, um, 
weaken the big six development companies, not by actually uh, attacking them head on, but by just ensuring that you are diversifying the market um, and having a big role for, for public providers. Um, we're in partnership, you know, with their communities too. Um, and I mean, it was interesting that when we had the workshops with the developers, I thought this would be a big no-no, but actually the developers split a bit on it and they thought, well, yeah, if there's, you know, if there's something that brings more land into the system, well, you know, we might benefit from that as well. Um, and so, you know, sometimes I think you just need to work through the detail of some of these that at the beginning, they might sign, oh, that would be very difficult to deliver. But actually, I think in practice, um, that is something that could be achieved. Yes, well, I, I was so uh, cheered by, by hearing what the, the Labour Planning Commission was, was concluding and, and the way that, that had developed. Uh, it seems to me that the, the, the really critical point we've heard from both of you is about how important planning is as a force for good. And a, it should be a public good. Uh, and uh, the, it seems to me that the, the, there's very little in the white paper which is going in that direction. Um, Labour Housing Group decided at its last executive that um, meeting that we would mount quite a big campaign on the white paper uh, once it gets to the a bill stage. And we will be focusing on areas with Tory MPs to try and inform Labour Party members about what is being proposed. And that seems to me to be very important. We need to, bit to work on um, that those people in the in in the, the Tory areas, whether whether it's the industrial parts of the north or the the, sh the rural counties, the shire counties in the, the southeast and elsewhere, to make sure that people understand what the implications are uh, and how how bad this will be for local communities, pretty much everywhere. Um, so, if if uh, if you aren't a member of Labour Housing Group. Um, please join us and um, you'll hear about that campaign. If you aren't a member of the Labour Housing Group but would like to bring that debate into your constituency, um, please do contact us because I think we really need this, this. This needs to be a major campaign around the country. So thank you very much, everybody, for attending. Thank you particularly to Sarah and Roberta for illuminating what is, is uh, there in front of us and, and hopefully will be defeated by the Tory shires. Um, but if, the, if, if we need to add our weight into that and I'm sure the Labour front bench will be doing so. So thank you very much, everybody, and hope to see you all again at the future event. Thank you, Sheila. Thanks, everybody. Thank Bye. You. Bye.